Welcome to Living Well. We're so glad that you joined us for another episode of an educational program about health and wellness, how to prevent diseases, how to manage your health in such a way that you can live well. Today, we have a very interesting topic that many people don't generally like to talk about, but we're going to talk about it because it has a very important part to play in your health. Today, our speaker is Emlyn Mark. She has a master's degree in public health administration. She is a registered nurse and the information that she will share with you is for educational purposes only. You may wanna take some notes though, because we will open it up at the end so that you can ask any questions that you may have regarding the topic today. Welcome Emlyn, we're so glad that you're here today. I am excited to be here once again. Thank you, Dr. Sankey for that introduction. And um, we are going to go ahead and start. So what I will do, I will share my um, screen with you guys. And um, we are going to be talking about, oh my goodness. Um, let me see here. Wonderful. So we are going to be talking about colorectal cancer. You know, March month was colorectal cancer awareness month. You know, we had so many wonderful topics um, already ahead of us, so we did not address it in March, but we're not too far out from March. We're just two days away from March. So I think it's still, we think it's still appropriate for us to talk about colorectal health um, for this month, well, in April, but normally colorectal health is recognized in the month of March. So what is colorectal health? We're gonna be talking about colorectal statistics, um, risk factors um, that we can um, maybe learn about so we can take um, note of symptoms, common symptoms um, for colorectal, cancer and prevention. How can we prevent? So colorectal cancer is um, cancer of the colon and rectum. Cancer of the colon and rectum. It's usually in the large intestine. It is not small, it's not involved in the small colon. So it's the colon and the rectum. So this whole organ that you see, this large tube that you see here is where colorectal cancer can take place. And it can be in any area of the colon. It is the third most diagnosed cancer and the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States among men and women. Colorectal cancer um, can be removed. So there you see um, there's a polyp. Colorectal cancer first starts as an abnormal growth in the colon or rectum called polyp. So this is a polyp, a polyp, and you can have a polyp or polyps um, in the colon. These polyps can be removed during a procedure called a colonoscopy. The good news is that colon rectal cancer is preventable. It's preventable with screening and, and is treatable with early detection. As a matter of fact, with early detection, colon rectal cancer has a 90% survival rate. So the key is screening and early detection. That's why we're talking about this today. So did you know, and we talk about some statistics here, did you know that most cases of colon rectal cancer affects individuals who are 45 years and older? One in 24 people will get colon rectal cancer in their lifetime. Each year, about 150,000 Americans are diagnosed with colon can colorectal cancer. This year, 2022, they are estimated that 151,030 people will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer. So it's just, as you can tell, the statistics for colorectal cancer is increasing. 
more than 50,000 50, um, people, Americans, die from colon rectal cancer in 2021. And they're estimating that this year, 2022, 52,580 people will die from colon rectal cancer. So again, we can see that the numbers are going up for debt, for the debt rate, but we can prevent this. We can put a, um, a stop to it and start bringing these numbers down. Um, colorectal cancer, deaths, that death rates are highest among Black um, African Americans, about 40% higher in this, in this population. And I found that um, a certain a type of Jews, I think it's pronounced Ash, Ashkenzi Jews, have one of the highest colon rectal cancer risk um, amongst any other ethnic group in the world. I, I didn't have a chance to research why this is so, but from what my research, what I was, what I read, that they have the highest cancer um, risk, even higher than blacks. Colorectal cancer can develop without symptoms. That's why we have to do screenings. That's why it's so important to screen. What are some of the um, the risk factors? What are some of the factors that um, are, are considered risk factors for colorectal cancer? So age is one of them. I know once upon a time they told us that when you're 50, uh, 50 years, you need to do colorectal screening, but I want to tell you today, I'm sorry, that they are now saying age 45. So um, anyone around this age group needs to do start doing screening for colon rectal cancer. Um, another risk factor is history of polyps or colon rectal cancer. So if you have a history of polyps, you need to keep checking with your doctor every three to five years, maybe for another colonoscopy. So they can repeat the colonoscopy so that they can see if there are any more growths. Now, if you have um, cancer, colorectal cancer, you need to keep check with your doctor because you want to make sure that this cancer is not reoccurring again. There's a condition called inflammatory bowel disease. Some people call it IBS. This is a condition where you have intermittent, intermittent constipation and diarrhea, cramping in the stomach. Um, after eating certain foods, you have abdominal pain. So inflammatory bowel disease can um, cause colon rectal cancer. So you hear the word inflammatory. So there's an inflammation going on in the, in the colon that's causing this, this problem. And you know, inflammation is one of the main causes for a lot of chronic diseases. And um, cancer is one of them. So if you have this condition, take caution and keep close check for colorectal um, disease. Um, family history, a family history of colon cancer, definitely you need to take um, precautions and um, follow up with your doctor. And inherited syndrome, I guess when I looked that up, it was talking about um, a condition called familial adenoma polyposis, which is FAP or, or um, Lynch, Lynch syndrome. That's a type of um, condition that some people might have if you have that condition, you are at risk for colon cancer, colorectal cancer. Type two diabetics. Now you might want to say, how come? Why type two diabetes have um, are at risk? At risk um, due to the fact that insulin is a um, growth hormone. People with, with type two diabetes have what we call chronic hyperinsulinemia, and therefore they will have 
a tendency to have abdominal growth. And what they're finding out that people with type two diabetes are um, at risk, have increased risk because of the growth factor IGF, which turns into, which can accelerate, can increase the process of cancer. Being overweight or obese is another condition that can be a factor for um, um, colon cancer, colorectal cancer. Because again, we have when you when uh, someone is over, over overweight, obese, they have increased serum um, leptin and also increase insulin level. And leptin is a hormone that is responsible for in, increasing or, or inducing a feeling of satisfaction when you, when you eat. But in someone that's obese, this level of this hormone is five times higher than a non-obese um, patient. And leptin, what leptin does, is also responsible for cell growth in the area of the colon. So then again, here you have problem with cell growing out of control and having problems with colon rectal cancer. Being of, I mean, I said not, okay. Not being physically active. Again, if you not physically active, you can gain weight and they're the same problem with um, increased leptin and insulin and all of that. So it just caused a domino effect. Having a diet high in red meat and processed meats. Now, I know we talked about one time about processed meats. These meats have chemicals and the way they prepare these food, they have to add these different chemicals in there to preserve it and all of that. These chemicals that they put in the, in the meat are cancer producing. So um, there you, you can increase, increase your risk of colorectal cancer by 20 to 30% by eating these types of meat because of the chemicals. Um, also, I want to mention um, barbecuing or grilling. Due to the fat in the meat and the heat, it also produces a type of chemical that can produce, that can cause colorectal cancer. So be careful with that. The, um, um, the ammonial acid and the sugars that are in the, the meat and, and the dressing you put on there to to season that meat creates um, a, a reaction with the heat and produce chemicals in that meat to cause um, cancer producing pro properties. Smoking, of course we know smoking is, is never healthy for anyone. Smoking can also cause um, colorectal cancer and overconsumption of alcohol. Those are some of the risk factors. So if we can il eliminate some of these risk, risk factors, we can see that we can reduce our chances for um, colorectal cancer. So what are some of the common side effects or symptoms? How, you know, how, how can I tell that something is wrong, that I'm having problems, that maybe I'm at risk, well, not at risk, but have a problem with my colon? So when you have these polyps, um, what can happen is bleeding. So with excessive bleeding, you can become weak and fatigued because your hemoglobin can drop and therefore you will feel weak and fatigued. So signs and symptoms, weakness and fatigue could be one of the signs and symptoms of colorectal cancer, blood in your stool. We need to always check how our, the color of our stool. If we find it dark, tarry, our stool should not be dark looking and tarry looking. That's a sign of bleeding. And you need to check with the doctor. Um, if you see bright red blood in your stool, that should not be, you need to check with the doctor. Uh, although sometimes 
blood in the stool, dark red, I mean, bright red blood or blood in your stool can be indication for other problems like a hemorrhoid. Um, if you have hemorrhoids, maybe that you can bleed because of that. Or maybe sometimes some medications you're taking, like aspirin or blood thinners can cause bleeding and that could cause your stool to have um, blood in it. So it's always important to um, check with your physician. Change in your bowel's habit. We need to know how often you know, we go to the bathroom. Some of us, as soon as we eat, we, we go to the bathroom. That's a good thing. Some of us maybe go to the bathroom every other day. Check on your bowel movement habit. If you see that there's a change, sometimes you maybe have really, um, you're constipated, or maybe you're not going, off, going to the bathroom as often, you need to check on these symptoms because it can be due to colon rectal cancer. And early prevention, early diagnosis is 90%, they said, chances of survival. Abdominal discomfort, um, unexplained weight loss. Um, these are all symptoms um, of, could be, could be related to colon rectal cancer. Um, stomach cramping, feeling full and bloated, and um, you always feel that you, your bowel is not emptied. Um, check on what's going on. Nausea and vomiting, another sign of or symptom of bowel, I mean, colon rectal cancer. So we need to know our bodies. We need to know how our bodies function. What is different when something is changing in our, in our bodies? Very important. So we talked about this, the, the um, symptoms, risk factors. Now, um, some tests that we need to do, things that we need to do. I talked about a colonoscopy. Now, if you have never had one and you're 45 or older, you need to sit down and talk with your doctor in regards to that. Let them know about family history, let them know about, you know, this, you know, conditions that you might have. So these, your doctor can make the best decision in what you need to do. Sometimes they will do stool sample. They do a stool sample to see if there's blood in your stool, they can detect certain cells in your stool. So um, that is one of the easiest tests. And I think I, re I will recommend doing this every year they have little kits that you can um, take home and do these different tests with and send it back to the lab and you'll be able to get results in no time. So to give you a peace of mind. And in the invasive procedure is the colonoscopy. We have also stigmoidoscopy, which will check just the lower portion of the colon here. Um, the colonoscopy will go all the way up and check the whole colon. Um, so those are different screenings that we can do for colonoscopy. As I mentioned, 45 is now the new 50. As I remember, um, they used to tell us, once you turn 50, you need to do your colonoscopy, colonoscopy then. But now they're encouraging us to do colonoscopy at age 45. Um, Prevention, so how do we prevent? We want to know how to prevent. Um, according to the American Cancer Society, here are six ways how to prevent colon rectal cancer. As I talked about screening, screening is number one, is one is number one to prevent um, and to detect colon rectal cancer early. Also, what we eat. We are what we eat. That's a true saying. So we need to get <clears throat> lots of vegetables, fruits, beans, and whole grain. What these foods have in common, they have fiber. Fiber is very important for the colon. <clears throat> fiber acts as a broom. You know, when you have your house, you have to sweep it out every so often. 
Because if you do not do that, it's going to be full of cobweb and all sorts of things that you do not want to be in your home. So you clean it, you sweep. But the fiber in our food acts like a broom and sweep the colon. It helps keep the colon um, biosystem regulated because you know that we need to keep that bio um, system in our gut at a certain level, good bacteria, so it can keep us healthy. Fiber can also do that. So a diet in high in fruits, vegetables, and a whole grain is good for our colon and it decreases the risk of rectal colon cancer. Um, and I talked about the luncheon meats and the um, red meat. If we can stay away from that, it's, it will even be better for us. Um, another um, preventive measure is exercise. Before I talk about exercise, I just remember, I just want to talk about also with our diet. I did not add it on here, but I want to talk about sugars. You heard me mention that our, we have to regulate and keep our, our colon um, bio system at a level where it is healthy. One of the things that destroys our colon um, bio system is sugar. Sugar feeds on the bacteria that's in our gut. It increases candida and other unhealthy bacteria in our gut and can cause problems. So be careful of especially simple um, white sugar, um, high fructose corn syrup, all those things that sweeten um, our, our drinks like sodas and, um, you know, sodas especially, is not healthy for us. So we need to try and avoid drinking too much um, sugar. Um, if you do not, it's better to drink even, even juices, even our fruit juice. Because when you take out the fiber, when you squeeze the orange, squeeze the apple, the fiber is not in that juice. So therefore you're just drinking pure sugar, which is also unhealthy. Although it's a fruit, but it's unhealthy because the fiber is not there. The, the fiber was made to go along with the sugar to help decrease the sugar absorption when we eat that fruit and also to help keep the colon um, healthy. Several studies have shown that people who have high level of um, serum level of vitamin D have lower rates of colorectal cancer. So vitamin D is also very important to help with colorectal cancer. Vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin. So when we take it, we need to eat it with food. Um, Vitamin D helps with our immune system and helps to keep us balanced. So therefore, vitamin D, and I also read calcium. So we need to get a balance of calcium and vitamin D. People who have um, used vitamin D and calcium have a lower rate of colorectal cancer. And um, I want to also mention that there are herbs that we can use. I know Dr. I mean. Ms. Sankey, Edna Sankey talked some weeks ago about foods that can help with our colon. And one of them was curcumin and quercetin. Now, we can find these two products in, um, in um, turmeric, has curcumin in it, and quercetin we can find in onions. So the onions and, and um, turmeric are very good for the colon to prevent um, colon rectal cancer. So those of you who maybe had polyps in the past, um, from what the study was saying, maybe we need to take um, a daily dose of curcumin. They were recommending 480 milligrams three times a day. 
and quercetin, which you can find in onions. Um, they were recommending 20 to 30 milligrams, I mean, 20 milligrams three times a day. So this can help shrink polyps. Um, so those of you who, who maybe had polyps in the past, look into products that you can use to help keep um, the polyps from, from growing back from sh and, and to help shrink the polyps. So I just wanted to mention that. Another um, preventive measure is exercise. Get regular exercise. We know that we need to exercise at least you know, five times a week um, for 30 minutes a day. Um, maybe you do not, you cannot do it all at once, but try and incorporate it, incorporate exercise throughout your um, daily activity. So it can help reduce the chances of colorectal cancer. Um, another risk factor is to control your weight. But as I mentioned before, obesity is one of the, the um, problems that can um, cause a risk factor for colon rectal cancer. So try and to control your weight. Um, being ob overweight or obese increases your risk of getting and dying from colon rectal cancer. So eating healthier so you can reduce your weight. Exercising so you can keep your weight down are very important. And of course, do not smoke. Smoking is not healthy. We all know that. People who have been smoking for a long time are more likely than people who do not smoke to develop and die from colorectal cancer. So if you know anyone who smokes, encourage them to stop smoking because they are causing um, an early death. This was according to the American Cancer Society. They are encouraging you know, those, of, those who smoke to stop smoking. Because again, when you the, 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 the um, chemicals that cigarettes produce all affects the colon and cause these growth, these cancerous growth to take place. Avoid alcohol. Alcohol also is something that we need to try and avoid because it can cause the um, growth of, of um, a risk factor for colorectal cancer. So what should you do? What should we do now? So now you hear about all what I just talked about. What should we do? Just to recap, if you're 45 years or older, remember, that's the new 50. We need to, um, we need to get screened. Talk to your doctor, especially if you have a family history of colorectal cancer. Know your family history. Do you or a family member have a history of colon polyps? Because as I mentioned before, um, how does colorectal um, cancer start is with that growth at polyp. It's usually um, benign, meaning that it's not cancerous, but if this continue to grow, it can turn into cancerous cells, it can turn into a cancer. So check for polyps. If you have history of polyps, make sure that you keep that regular um, colonoscopy that the doctor recommend that you do. Do you or your family member have a history of colorectal cancer? Make sure you, you get screened every three or so years according to what your doctor recommends. Do you have a chronic inflammatory bowel dis, um, syndrome or ulcerative colitis or Crohn's? Those type of inflammatory conditions of the colon are precursors to colon rectal cancer. So if you can get it under control, you need to try and get that under control and try and follow up with the doctor. I cannot stress that enough. Follow up is very important. Do you or your family member have ovarian or endometrial um, or stomach cancer? Um, you need to keep check. Keep check. These are things you need to check on. And are you African-American or Black, Hispanic, or um, from that 
a, I mean, Jewish group of people who are high risk for colon cancer, colorectal cancer, please keep um, doctor's appointment and get checked out. Don't be afraid to sit down and talk with your doctor about signs and symptoms signs and symptoms that you might be experiencing because early prevention is very important to prevent and to treat um, colorectal cancer. It is 90% treatable if we can um, get on top of it at an early time. So get with your doctor, let them advise you what's the best um, treatment, what's the best care for you so that you can prevent colorectal cancer. Thanks for listening. Um, if there are any questions, um, I can entertain them now. Evelyn, that was a great overview of um, how to really prevent colorectal cancer. I was very amazed that the statistics are going up instead of going down. I mean, I would think that with education that people would take more active role in their health and go get a colonoscopy, um, you know, at the age of 45. I didn't know that the uh, 45, it had dropped down to 45. So that's new information. What I also learned that I didn't know that diabetics were at a higher risk because they're taking insulin, you know, and that that is a hormone. So I learned a lot from what you um, presented today. And I would I would encourage you all to open your mics. And if there's any questions that you have for Emily, that you go ahead and ask those questions. Um, yeah, now is a good time. Anybody has any questions? I didn't see any in the chat box. Emily, you know, one yeah. thing that also you mentioned was about um, family history, talking about your family history. What I find among African-Americans, particularly people don't talk about what people diseases or what they died from or anything like that. So any suggestions of how to bring the conversation up as it relates to, let's say if someone has gotten a recent diagnosis about colorectal cancer, because it seems like cancer is one of those things everybody keeps a secret. Everybody talks about COVID and do you get a shot, you have this, but no one's talking about the prevention of how to, you know, of cancer, the screenings, or if they actually have you know, have been diagnosed with it. It's just one of those topics that people don't talk about. What do you suggest as a way to get people talking about their health with their family? Yeah, you know, that's so true. We we try to avoid certain certain issues because we feel that if we do not know about it, it's not going to happen. And, you know, I, it seemed like if I don't talk about something, it's not going to happen. But it's so very important to know your family history. So... Um, education. Education is so very important. So with what I just mentioned to that tonight, you know, we are a bit more educated. So I would encourage those who are on, um, online tonight that they would be the one to initiate, initiate that conversation with their family members. Find out, you know, your grandparents die, you have no clue what they died from. Start talking about, you know, grandpa, grandma died, you know, you know, I was a little kid when they died, so I don't even remember what happened. Talk to your parents. What did they die from? You know, do we have any family history? Because you might not know maybe an aunt or somebody in the past died, because you know, you have to look at from what I was reading, you have to look at not just immediate family also extended family also to find out the history because of the fact that colorectal cancer can be something that is so it is that is genetic so i will encourage those of us who are listening to start the initiate that conversation and then you'll be surprised maybe once you start that conversation you will learn so much so that's what i will say and then the next thing i i want to believe um, why are we so afraid about even going to the doctor and talking about our colon is because people are afraid or they do not want to go through that colonoscopy because it's an invasive procedure and it's, a, it's uncomfortable. You have to, you know, cleanse the bowels 
um, the day before. And some people you're gonna have to be NPO or nothing to eat for several hours. At least the day before you have to start not eating or just eating lightly and then the night off you cannot eat anymore. So people don't want that uncomfortable feeling so they avoid it. But that's the worst thing you can do. You, we, we need to at least every five years, if you do not have colon any problems, I guess I recommend every 10 years, but we need to really um, get tested. And then a simple test is the stool test that you can do you know, without any invasive, it's not an invasive procedure, you can do it every, every year just to keep check on making sure there's nothing wrong going on. Thank you for sharing that, Emily. Any questions for Emily? Any comments? Anything that you learn new? You know, Emily, one of the things that you mentioned, and I think this is very key, I don't know if, if everyone picked up on this, but every time we have a bowel movement, we should know what it looks like, the color, the consistency. Um, and I know that people don't like to look behind in the toilet, but I think we should look in the stool after every bowel movement. And that is because things can change just that quickly because one bowel movement may not have anything and the other one could have blood in it or it could have nothing in it, but we don't know that if we don't look. So I think it's really knowing your body and looking at it to see how, you know, is it, is it a regular, is it loose, is it what, you know? So um, I just think you have to, be able to keep looking every time so that we'll be able to detect anything. And many times people just, you know, they count a constipation as something normal. Mm -hmm. right. And that could yeah. be a sign of something that's not going right. That's true. Yeah. Especially if you do not have a history of constipation, all of a sudden you're getting constipated. What's going on? Look at you, you know, what you're eating, um, how much water are you drinking. Um, those are all indicators that, you know, you need to change because you are now not drinking enough water or you can uh, make you um, constipated or you're not eating the fiber, foods with fiber cause you to be constipated. But, you know, also any changes, check with your doctor. Amen. I have something to say about the test. I think like 10 years ago, the pre to get prepared for that was bad. You have this big thing you have to drink that is awful. But things have changed now. Um, I think you only have to drink it three times. So to me, the process is a whole lot easier. Then once it's done, oh, that's the best sleep you ever have. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And it's better to just go through it and to be safe than to say, I wish I did it when it's too late. Yeah, because it's very subtle, you know, it's very subtle. And by the time you recognize that you're having problems, it things have, can be so much worse. It could be stage three, stage four, where it's now spread to other organs in the body. Mm -hmm. So if you can contain it right there, that polyp, just get that thing snipped out or, you know, is not spread to other areas of the body, it is so much easier and so preventable. Absolutely. A comment, please. Oh. Okay. Um, one of the things as I've been reading, researching, listening to the experts on cancer, one of the main things that we are not really educated on is our diet when we have cancer. When we have cancer, we cannot go and eat normally. Our diets have to be adjusted especially in the sugar area, because the sugar is one that helps the cancer cells to grow. If they are starved of the sugar, it will be a better healing process, not so severe. So we really have to be educated because some cancers can go away if we start eating how we're supposed to be, but doctors don't know that. A lot of us don't know that. So it's good to do our research and look at the studies that have been done and see where our diet comes in. 
because if it's not too far along our diet, especially in the sugar area, can do wonders for us along the way. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Josephine, for mentioning that. That is so true. Sugar feed, cancer feeds on sugar. As a matter mm -hmm. of fact, when um, someone has cancer and they want to see the cancer spread throughout the body, they do a, um, a what a scan. Oh boy. Pet a, scan. A pet scan. Thank you. They do mm -hmm. a pet scan. And what a pet scan is, they inject you with sugar. Yep. That fluid that goes through your vein is dextrose, sugar. And what happens, the area where cancer, the cancer spread to, it lights up. The CAT scan can pick that up, but it's now bright light, it's all lit up. And they can tell, well, the cancer spread here, there, and everywhere, because wherever that cancer cell, or wherever, wherever the cancer cell is, the, the sugar gravitates to it. So that's why we have to be very careful with sugar. Um, you know, craving for sugar is indicating something is wrong. Whenever you start craving sugar, something is wrong. So maybe because you have too much yeast, too much candida, something with the bowel floor is not, not right. Um, so take check and um, try to bring that craving down. And, you know, I know when I bring my craving down, what I, what I, can, what I do is I just, eat more greens, vegetables. I don't even eat that much fruit. I, if I do eat fruit, it's gonna be the berries, but I eat lots more dark green vegetables and that craving will go away. Mm -hmm. Pamela, thank you again, again and again for such a thorough presentation on how to care for our colon. And like I said, that's a topic that people really don't like to talk about, um, but that is a very important topic because we do know the colon, a vital um, organ in the body where the nutrients and different things are absorbed and actually eliminated from the body. So thank you, Emily. Any final words for our audience? I think one of my final words would be if you're 45 and over, haven't had your colonoscopy, that would be number one for 2022 to get your colon checked out. Mm -hmm. Yes. I um. I think I learned somewhere that the, the, the meat, especially the red meat, we don't want to have the capacity to really break it down as it should. So when we eat it, it sits in our colon for quite a while and it rots. And that rotting harbors bad bacteria and that is one way that this cancer can start in the colon. If you don't get that colonoscopy, that's why when I read Emily's list of the things, the risks, and I saw red meat, I say, yes, that is one that I read about that just sits in the colon until it rots. And that that's can be... Mm -hmm. If you don't eat the high fiber to help sweep it out and drink your water and all that, possibility can be developed into cancer. It's possible. Yeah, that is so true, Josephine. Thanks for bringing that out. Um, because first of all, they are feeding our, the animals with all these chemicals. They're spraying the grass with chemicals. The, cow, they eat these chemicals. They are giving cows food that they were not designed to eat, like corn and other dead animal, you know, parts of dead animals. They're giving these, uh, these cows all of these things to eat. All of that cause inflammatory process to go on inside the cow. Now, when we eat that meat, we're eating all of that, what the cow ate in the past, the inflammatory process that the cow experienced and all of that. And imagine, here you are now eating that meat. It's not digest, it's, you know, you, you think it's digesting, but it's just sitting there and putrefying. Mm -hmm. Imagine 
what is going on in our colon. So therefore, the reason why I want to believe that there's an increase, although with all the education we have out there, why there's an increase in um, colon rectal cancer is because of the easy, the easy access that we have to so much meat that we are not eating and we are not eating enough high fiber foods that to help sweep that colon out that is causing this problem. So if we can decrease our meat consumption, especially red meat and those um, pre-packaged food, those luncheon meat, terrible. They have so much chemicals in it. But you know, Emily, excuse me, we are eating too much. There's a lot of amount, four to six ounces of protein mm -hmm. per day, 0. Mm -hmm. 0. 0.8 per kilogram of body weight, four to six ounces a day. And if you check what we eat per day, it is, it's more than that. And protein doesn't only meet, only mean animal products. You have beans and peanut butter and all those other plant protein that we can substitute sometimes. We can eat your animal product, but substitute one or two meals with some plant protein to reduce the risk of developing cancer or right. whatever else can be caused by those meats. I'm, not, yeah. I'm gonna say nothing is really wrong. Nothing is wrong with eating meat and chicken and turkey. We need to get the organic stuff of those products and eat the required amount of ounces per day. We have breakfast, lunch, supper. So mm -hmm. we can choose one of those meals not to eat any animal products for one or two meals a day. And that will greatly reduce the risk of a lot of these diseases caused by by the meats. Wonderful. Thank you, our expert dietitian. Thank you, Josephine. I, it's, you know, it's just so wonderful to hear from all these experts. Um, you know, we are blessed. Thank you. Yes. So I just will encourage everyone um, to take what you have heard today and put it into action. Make sure if you have not had a colonoscopy and you're 45 years and older, go at, check out, um, talk to your doctor so that they can direct you in what to do. If you have family history of any kind of colon polyps or cancer or any type of cancer as a matter of fact, talk to your doctor so that they can direct you in the right direction to go. And be careful of what you eat. We are what we eat. So let us make sure we put in our bodies foods that are healthy and wholesome so that we can live a healthier life. Thank you again and again, audience, for being here today. Take this information, share it with your family. At least find one person that you know that's over 45 that maybe have not had their colonoscopy, and maybe they have, but you can share with them the signs and the symptoms and actually some of the risk factors. We can't change our age, but there's some things that we can change what we eat, drink, and do. So we can get more active, absolutely eat more fruits and vegetables and grains and nuts. Thank you for joining us next week. Dr. Carlene Sinclair will be our presenter. She's been with us before. She's gonna actually share some very, very, very important information about health and wellness. I would ask that you would invite a friend, a family member, a coworker, someone to join us on Living Well. We are trying to get ready. We wanna be well here, but we wanna be well on our way as we prepare for heaven as well. So thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna take prayer requests at this time.